Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. Amen. If we could all stand to our feet and give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight, that would be excellent. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night. There's no place I'd rather be. Amen. But in the presence of the Lord God Almighty, I was reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning, and I just want to share with us a couple of verses before we open up the service in prayer. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 says, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. So why don't we open this service tonight by asking the Lord to fill us up with his love, that the love of God would be exemplified in us and through us one toward another, Hallelujah. And let's show a love for the truth tonight, praying that the love of God would consume us. Hallelujah. Let's just lift up our hands tonight. Lord, we come before you, Father, and we glorify your name, Jesus. We open up this service tonight, Father, asking that your spirit would enter in, Lord God. That you would consume us in your love, Lord Jesus. Your unending, your limitless your perfect love, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. And we ask, Father, that you would fill us up with your love to overflowing, God. That we might love one another, Lord Jesus. As you have said, a new command I give unto you. That you love one another as I have loved you. Hallelujah, Lord. We pray that you would help us tonight. That we would love one another, Lord Jesus. And not just those in the faith, God. But those that are lost and broken, Lord Jesus. That they too might come to know that there is a God in heaven who loves them with an unending love, with a love that is the justification for the crucifixion at Calvary. Hallelujah, God. We lift up your holy name, Jesus, and we thank you for your love, God. We worship you tonight, Father, and we give you all that we have. Hallelujah. And if you love the Lord, why don't you just clap your hands right now? And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you have the victory in Jesus? He's already said it. He's done it. It's already been. So we got the victory.
to forget all of the great things you did when did I throw away faith for the impossible to the impossible and when did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles you do miracles you are more than able Faith in 
situation. I trust you, Jesus, right where I am. I trust you in the moment. I trust you with everything. All that I am, Jesus, I trust you. I surrender. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit, Jesus. I know there are many needs in this room. I know that many come into this place in spiritual battle and heaviness and I just feel that it's not just an isolated battlefield but the battlefield has expanded the 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 boundaries that Satan is pushing he's pushing the boundaries that God has put in place to protect and Satan is actively trying his best in this moment to destroy what God is trying to put together. As God begins to elevate and raise up, Satan is there seeing what is happening, and he's doing his best to pull down what God elevates to, to break up what God puts together. And so in this room tonight, I wonder if it would be appropriate with so many in this place, if we can just take the hand of the one next to us. You don't know what battle they're facing. You don't know what they walked in here with. You don't know what situation they're facing right now. And you don't know if they're about ready to give up on their walk with God. You don't know if Satan's fighting harder than ever before. You don't know the situation. You don't know the details. But you can bind together right now as a family. And we can pray for one another. We can lift each other up. We can edify each other in the presence of God. We can let God's spirit move and God's spirit reign in us and through us in this place. God, right now in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray victory. We pray strength. We pray covering right now in Jesus' name upon every individual in this room. God, that no matter what we're facing and no matter what we're going through, we know that you're able to see us through. We know that you're able to walk us through the valley. God, although it appears as though it's my end, Lord God, you know that you're bringing me through to victory. You know you're bringing me through to elevate me. God, you know you're raising up a church in Bellflower. You're raising up a church in LA, Jesus. You're raising up a body of believers that's going to change the world. And so God, strengthen the body right now. God, whatever we're facing and whatever we're battling, I pray right now for unity. And Lord, I pray unity to grow and thrive as we stand together against the devices of the enemy, against the plan of the enemy. God, you are able. You are able, Jesus. So tonight, give peace. Tonight, give rest. Tonight, Jesus, let your spirit quicken us together. And Lord, do a work in Jesus' name. Thank you, 
Yes, that's it. You can feel the peace that's resting in this room right now. You can feel the peace of God that's already flowing into this place. You can feel strength being poured into every believer. You can feel the strength of God's spirit. You can feel his power overcoming in your thoughts, the fears and the anxiety and the worries. God is removing all anxiety right now. Just let the anxiety flow out of your spirit. Let go of the fear. Let go of the trepidation. Let go of what you've been hanging on to. Let God fight for you. Let God tell you and affirm you that the victory's already been won. The victory's already prepared for you. Can you imagine with all of the faith in God, if I'm fighting in my physical body, Lord, I pray for a miracle. Lord, to touch every individual in this room. God, if it's a prayer, if it's a battle of finance, God, I pray right now for blessing. And I pray for the open up the windows of heaven. God, bring victory to every situation. Bring victory to every home. Bring victory to every marriage. Bring victory to every family. Bring victory to every child. God, let us find ourselves in a place of victory with you. situation is not as it appears. God has another plan. God has a way of escape. Jesus has already prepared the path before you. For some in this room, what you've been facing, first of all, we got to recognize that whatever we face, God allows us to face it, okay? He, He knows what we're able to conquer. He knows what we're able to fight. He knows what we're capable of dealing with and handling. So what you're facing, it's not that God has not allowed it. But what we're facing, God has allowed to happen. I was in prayer this afternoon, and and the Lord revealed to me that there is so much spiritual warfare going on right now in his kingdom. It's like the kingdom of God truly is suffering a spiritual violence. The kingdom of God is in a place of constant battering and constant uh, attack. And it's the attack that you're trying to get away from, but it's almost like these attacks, uh, you're good today, you get the victory tonight, but then tomorrow morning you wake up uh, and right there's the battle again right in front of you. And it's like, God, I don't know how many times I can get up and face the same battle and a different battle. I don't know how many more days I can wake up and fight. I was in prayer this afternoon, and I really feel that God, in some situations in this place, it's almost like he's been keeping this 
He's been holding on to the situation. It had been formulated months ago, and he's been holding on to it. And some have wondered, how is the situation coming up now? I thought it was already dealt with. I thought it was already good. I thought we'd already addressed it. But all of a sudden, here it is again. And what I feel in prayer is that God kept some things, and he's been saving them. Because he knows his people. He knows that sometimes the only way he can get us on our knees is if if he gets us in battle. Sometimes he knows the only way he can get us focused off the distractions of this world, if he puts us in the hot battle, right in the smack dab middle of the battlefield. And so some, some in this room, God has been keeping what you're going through at bay. But tonight and this week and this month, he has begun to let things come into your life, not in an effort or intention to destroy, but in an effort and intention to get your focus back on him, to get your thought back on him, to get back in place with him on the battlefield. Satan is wanting to destroy, and God knows you got to be strong to overcome. And so he's building strength in his church. He's building strength in his people. And so what you think is meant to destroy you. It's actually meant to make you stronger. So I'm going to hang on to his strength. I'm going to let his strength enter into my spirit. I'm going to hang on to the purpose that God is here to bring me through. God is here to bring me through. And so if you're fighting tonight, I want you to know you do not fight alone. You do not fight alone. You do not fight alone. I'm just curious, how many in this room are in the middle of a spiritual battle? Let's be honest tonight. How many here? Look around the room. Look around the room. You are not alone, right? You thought you were the only, sh- the, the only boat out on the sea, right? You thought you were the only boat in the storm. Uh-uh, no. There's a whole bunch of whole bunch of boats in this storm tonight in this room. And it does not happen that way unless there is some type of spiritual shift and spiritual moving. I'm here to proclaim to this church that what God is going to do in 2024, Satan is trying to stop because everything God has promised, God is going to begin to open up the doors. He's going to begin to open up the windows of heaven. Everything that he's spoken into you, it's going to begin to come to pass. And Satan wants to stop you. Satan wants to destroy you. And God is telling you you're strong enough to get through it. Uh, Hold on to my strength and let me bring you through. Because God is going to bring you through. He's going to bring you through. Say, I'm going to make it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to make it. This is not meant to destroy you. Amen. We're going to make it together in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I don't know what your battle looks like, right? Some of us have an emotional battle. Some of us have a physical battle. Some of us have a financial battle. Some of us had a relational battle, right? That battlefield looks different for each of us. But here's the thing about the battlefield. As long as you stay on the battlefield, you're going to be able to conquer and overcome, right? David did not fall while he was on the battlefield. Right? He did not fall while he was on the battlefield, but he fell in sin when he got himself off the battlefield. He should have been in the battle. His army was away fighting, and David stayed at home. And it was when he was all by himself, and he isolated himself. Let me, I'm talking to somebody right now. You want to isolate yourself? You want to run and hide? And that's what Satan wants you to do, because he knows in isolation he can conquer you. When you get alone by yourself and your own thoughts, uh, that's when Satan enter, enters in, and he starts playing with your mind. He wants to isolate you. When David isolated himself and kept himself at home, that's when he failed. It's when he got off the battlefield that he failed. So rather than running from the battlefield, God, I'm going to run to it. I'm going to run to it. I'm going to stay engaged. I'm going to stay engaged. God has a purpose for all things, and even what you're going through, there's a purpose to it. There's a purpose. There's a plan. You may not see it right now. You may not see it in the moment. 
But once you get past and you look back, you'll see, okay, God, I see what you were about. I see what you were about. So don't get caught up in the moment, but hang on to faith for tomorrow. Hang on to faith for tomorrow. Because eventually you'll, you'll look back and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the battle. Mm. Our perception of the battle will change. And no longer will I say, God, why am I going through this? It's going to change to where, thank you, Lord, I see the purpose. Thank you, Lord, I see the plan. Thank you, Lord, I see your desire for me. So whatever you're facing tonight, I want you to just know that the way through is grabbing a hold of Jesus and not letting go. Grabbing a hold of Jesus and not letting go. He will see you through. He will see you through. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But he is with you always, even until the ends of the earth. He is with us always. Somebody say always. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go and receive an offering tonight. We're going to celebrate and worship the Lord through giving. And as you give tonight through tithes and offerings, know that God sees, God knows, God is moving. And you, as you put your faith and trust in Him, He will always, always be present and respond to your faith and trust. He will always respond to your faith and trust. So thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving tonight, tithes and offerings. And I know that God is helping us. God is leading us. God is caring for us and providing for us. If we can all stand, we're going to pray right now in Jesus' name. Pray for this offering. Pray that God use it. Pray that God multiply it. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, in Jesus' name right now, we thank you for what you've already done in this room. God, we thank you for the strength that has been poured into this place. We thank you for the peace, Jesus, that you have given. The peace that passes all understanding, God. The peace that goes beyond my limited understanding. And thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in this room. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you take this offering. And God, multiply it. Use it, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give and sow in your kingdom. We pray right now in Jesus' name that you bless this offering and you bless every individual that's able to give right now in Jesus name we give you praise honor and glory in Jesus name and everyone said amen why don't you tell somebody you love them before you're seated I love you it's good to see you in the house of the Lord good to see you in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday night you made it <laughs> you made it through traffic you came after a hard day at work and I know God is going to bless tonight God is going to move tonight. How many came expecting for God to do something? Amen. I came expecting God to do something. Now, here's the thing with that something is I'm going to let God fill in the blank of what that something is, right? But I'm going to trust Him to know exactly what I need. I'm going to trust him to know exactly what I need. I don't even know what I need. I don't even know, but God does. God knows exactly what my needs are, and I'm just going to trust him for him to supply every one of my needs. Amen. And so a couple things to remind everybody of. We got a couple events coming up, and we want to make sure that everybody is able to participate and everybody's aware of what's going on. First of all, did everyone see the table out there when you first walked in with the All Nations Day flyer? Yes, it is that time of year again. Our favorite Sunday is right around the corner. All right? And there are sign-up sheets there for number one, if you want to participate in the International Buffet afterwards and you want to uh, cook something that is of your ethnicity. We love food, so you can sign up and help us, and we're going to have a massive buffet, all right? So it's going to be awesome. There's also a sign-up sheet. If you'd like to represent your country, please sign up, as we have over 40 different nationalities in IPC, and we like to celebrate every single one of them. We like to celebrate every nationality and every ethnicity. 
All right, and so if you want to help us celebrate and you want to be a representative of your country, there's also a sign-up sheet for that. And then tomorrow morning, all the ladies said amen. I was trying to get you, Brother Max. <laughs> I was trying to get you. <laughs> tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. is ladies' devotion in the fellowship hall. And it's going to be amazing. You will be blessed, ladies. And then also we have a ladies' Thanksgiving potluck coming up this Friday, November 10th at 7 p.m. Okay, please see Sister Sonia De La Cruz for more details for our ladies' Thanksgiving potluck. The ladies are very busy. And I see that. You ladies stay busy. You keep the roads hot. My goodness. So, ladies, you're going to have a good time Friday night. And then we've got this Sunday. Everyone said this Sunday is an improv to friend day. All right, so that means we're going to do our part to bring as many friends as we can to the house of God. Now, we're not going to have an iPad raffle for our friends, but we are going to have a raffle. We're going to give away some good IPC merch. All right, so, and then uh, whoever brings the uh, most guests, you can pick whatever you want out of the IPC merch store, and we'll order it for you. One item, all right, for whoever brings the most guests, you get to pick something out of the merch store and we're going to get it for you, all right? So that's this Sunday as well as this Sunday is Heroes Day. We're going to honor our heroes, all of our first responders, our veterans. And so if you are a part of that group, veteran, uh, current serving military, active military, or first responder, you are welcome to wear your colors on Sunday, all right? You're welcome to come in your official attire on Sunday as we celebrate you and honor you and love on you. And so that's going to be this Sunday at 1.30 at the Artesia campus. And then we have on Friday, November 17th at 7 p.m., a youth and hyphen Friendsgiving. All right. Friendsgiving for youth and hyphen. If you want to know more details, see Sister Jenny or Brother Louis de la Cruz, and uh, they will have all the details for you. And then our very first our first ever, and I believe annual, family day field trip is coming up on November 18th. So we're going to meet at the Riley's Farm at 930 out near Ukaipa, and uh, we're going to have a great time hayride. We're going to have lunch. We're going to be picking, I don't know, some kind of fruit or vegetables. Or doing, we're going to be doing something that farmers do. Okay, and who knows what that is, but we're going to figure it out. Everybody that goes, you will be farmers by the time you leave, all right? So maybe they can turn my, my, my thumb into a green thumb that I can actually plant a plant and it not die. That's what I'm hoping for. But our family day field trip is going to be awesome. You're not going to want to miss it. And, of course, remember our All Nations Day coming up November 19th. It's going to be amazing. Amen? Amen. And so tonight is a special night. We don't get to do this very often and uh, last week, as we had launched our Kingdom Culture series, the Lord already impressed upon me where we were going to be going for this week. And so I I'm excited because this topic is one that is very applicable for every single one of us. It's a topic that I don't know if we're going to get through tonight, but we're going to do our best. All right? And so, but I'm going to need some help, so I'm going to ask my wife, Sister May, if she'll join me on the platform. So we don't get to do this very often, but when we do, we have a good time. Which seat do you want? Okay, she has a favorite side. All right, I've learned after 13 years of marriage, she has a favorite side. Every time we take a selfie, she's on, no, change, change sides. That's not my side, that's not my angle. So she's got the right side. And so tonight, we're going to be diving into a topic that um, is difficult to face, but so necessary as it is a part of kingdom culture. Because it is our goal at IPC to not only have IPC culture, but that IPC culture mimic, mirror, and represent kingdom culture, right? We want to have the culture of Jesus Christ, and so in that, there are certain things that we participate in that is a part of kingdom culture. 
And so for this evening, I'm going to be going to the word of the Lord, and you're welcome to stay seated tonight. That's fine because we're seated as well. We're just going to sit at home together. All right, this is Bible study with everybody. All right, we're just imagine we're sitting around the table. We've had a good dinner. All right, just to use your imagination. Maybe some of you are hungry. It's okay. Use your imagination. You'll be fine. We've just had a good dinner, and now we are going to have a good study and discussion, and we're going to be going to the book of Matthew, the 18th chapter, Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to read a, a series of scriptures here, verses 21 to 35, and uh, we're going to be focusing on the biblical narrative as Jesus begins to tell a parable. When Jesus would teach, He would use stories. That's why so many people liked hearing him speak. It was not like anybody they'd ever heard before. It wasn't like going to synagogue and hearing the rabbi speak. It was something different as Jesus would challenge his audience with stories. Are you ready to be challenged tonight? Are you ready to have the Lord challenge you? Because that's what he was doing in the area and the audience that he would, had before him. Verse 21 of the 18th chapter of Matthew says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? It's almost like, God, when can I stop forgiving? Maybe just up to seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. In other words, you keep going until you just keep going, right? It, it just don't stop, right? That's one of the, 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 the points that we're going to be talking about is that forgiveness doesn't stop. My decision to forgive does not stop. In verse 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That's a lot of talents. Okay? But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me, I pray I will, pay, I will pay you all. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. How many would like to have your debt forgiven? Right? Yeah, just take all my debt, Jesus. Just take it all. Just let it all be gone. Now, amen, Brother Isaac. He already did. Yes. Verse 28. All right. That same servant that was just forgiven... He went out and found some of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. And then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Because you asked, I forgave. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry. And delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. One servant was thrown to prison, but the servant that could not extend forgiveness went beyond prison to torturers. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And so... For this evening, Sister May and I are going to have a very casual conversation on the topic of kingdom culture, forgiveness, right? Forgiveness. And so when we look at forgiveness, it is a part of God's kingdom. 
It is a biblical principle that God challenges us to forgive. And in this position of forgiveness, it is a stance that I forgive. Why? Because I need forgiveness. How many in this room need forgiveness from God, right? Now, how many in this room, let's take it a step further, how many need forgiveness from their brother or sister, right? Forgiveness from those that we can tangibly see and touch, and maybe I've offended somebody and I didn't know it, and I'm in need of your forgiveness, right? And and so, if I'm in need of forgiveness, I can only receive forgiveness if I'm willing to give forgiveness, right? I learned early on that I am one of the first ones to step in line to forgive. Because, why? Because I have received much forgiveness. Because I have received much forgiveness, I try my best to forgive. I I had a moment as a young minister, and uh, there was somebody on the platform at one of our big events, and there was rumors going on about this young man, and um, there was so many, you know how the rumor mill is, right? It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and so... There was a group that I was around that said, I'm not even going in there with that guy on the platform. I'm not going to church with that guy on the platform and ministry because of what he's done. And I joined him. I was like, yeah, you guys are right. And the Lord convicted me. He says, well, if he shouldn't be on the platform, you shouldn't be on the platform. And I was like, okay, Jesus, I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm going to go pray. And I'm going to go in there and enjoy service, right? Because to whom much has been forgiven, they will offer forgiveness. And so we need to extend the hand of mercy through the opportunity to forgive, to be a part of kingdom culture. So in kingdom culture, I forgive so that I might be forgiven. In Ephesians 4, verses 31 to 32, it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So the first step to forgiveness is getting rid of all bitterness, because bitterness doesn't just happen overnight. It builds up over time. So what is bitterness? It's pikia in Greek. Pikia. Pikia. In Greek, meaning poison. She's good. That's, that's what it literally means. It's poison. Okay? So bitterness has a process. Like I said earlier, it doesn't just happen overnight. It's a process. So it starts with disappointment. You get disappointed. Then the second step is frustration. So the meaning of frustration is a state of insecurity and dissatisfaction arising from unresolved problems or unfulfilled needs. So we get frustrated over situations that we don't have control over. Really, bitterness is all about control. We want to be in control. We want to control the person's reaction, what they say. And if we can't control that, guess what? We get frustrated, right? So my question, if you have your notebook so that you can think about this, your answer, is what frustrates you? (laughs) You have like a million things in your mind right now, right? Do I have a book? (laughs) Forget the notepad. What frustrates you? Now, my second question is what do you do with your frustration? How do you respond when you're frustrated? I tell you about it. (laughs) Okay, so we got disappointment, we got uh, frustration, and then the next step to bitterness is anger because we're not getting what we want. It's not happening how we want it to happen. We're not in control of the situation. We get frustrated. So we get angry, right? So... How do we get rid of all bitterness? Because that's what the Bible says. We got to get rid of it. Got to get rid of all the bitterness in in our hearts, in our spirit. So I'm going to call it bitterness detox. (laughs) Have you ever experienced detoxing? 
I know Pastor is in the middle a detox of detox right now. Right now. He's, he's having his withdrawals and his headaches and because he hasn't had soda for a week and he's cranky. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. I, I've been completely <laughs> delivered of Coke Zero, praise God. <laughs> but it's a battle, let me tell you about it. So to detox. That's why I carry water with me everywhere. Yes, he's, he's almost fainting right now. So God will help us in Jesus' name, help us. But, but we're going to do a bitterness detox. So to detox is cleansing, right? Cleanse any toxic or unhealthy substances in our bodies. Okay, Philippians 4 verses 8, we discussed this yesterday at the Tuesday night Bible study. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if, there's any, if, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. All right. So in order for us to get rid of bitterness, we must be intentional with what we allow in our minds. Okay, it's very difficult to be intentional, but we have to be. Okay, so it matters who you surround yourself with. If you surround yourself with toxic, negative people, you're going to have bitterness. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how prayed up you're here in the platform, you're dancing in the aisles, and you're just, you've got anointing oil dripping all over you. <laughs> If you surround yourself with people that are toxic and negative, you're going to be bitter. That's just how it's going to be. And if we surround ourselves with unhealthy relationships, that's not God's will for us. You know it's not God's will because they're, instead of helping you get closer to God, you get more angry, you get more irritated, you get more bitter. Okay. And then also bad news. I'm sorry. I know we like to watch news and the updates of what's going on in the world. And we do need to be aware of what's happening in the world. But when we are so consumed by the bad news, it's toxic. Remember, we're getting rid of it. We're, we're, we're cleansing. We're, we're detoxing. So we cannot allow our minds to be uh, just focused on these bad news. <laughs> Because we're thinking about whatever's lovely, whatever's good report. Whose report will you believe? And another thing is overcome the urge, overcome the, the temptation to speak negative about or against someone or against something. It's very difficult, especially if you're wounded and you're hurting and you just want to keep talking about how annoying that person is and how, you know, and I'm not going to say the word. <laughs> but anyway, we just want to keep talking about that situation over and over and over again. And in order for us to get rid of the bitterness, and we're doing a detox, we're cleansing our minds, cleansing our hearts, we need to avoid the urge to speak negative, anything that is negative. James 3, oops, James 3 verses 8 to 10 says, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and, the, and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. We, the tongue is such a powerful thing. Very, very powerful because this can be a tool to forever damage somebody or bless someone. And if we are intentional about whatever we're thinking is lovely, of good report, we have to be mindful of what we say. Amen? Amen. When we continually revisit the hurtful things by speaking about it over and over and over again, what happens is we keep talking about it over and over and over again, and this is my drama, this is my situation, it's never going to end. If we continue to do that over and over again, we delay the process of healing. And how many of you know that it's God's will for us to be healed? He doesn't want us to stay in the same thing forever. He wants us changed. He wants us whole. He wants us healed. Amen. 
Amen. In a healed state. Part of my bitterness detox is a punching bag. I don't, don't know how many of you need that. <laughs> Whenever I, I think about trying to overcome those deep-seated emotions, because bitterness is not a surface-level emotion. It is deep inside of us, and the more we allow it to fester, the deeper it goes, to where then it not only just affects me, but it affects everyone around me. And in that place of bitterness, it becomes very difficult to forgive and reach and obtain reconciliation. You see, Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24 tells us, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come again and offer your gift. You see, when do you, you practice reconciliation? And when do you practice forgiveness? Because what happens if the person you're trying to be reconciled with doesn't want to reconcile with you? And then you just become that annoying person that they avoid every time they see you on the parking lot. Oh, here they come and you run, they run the other direction because, yeah, you're trying to reconcile, but yet they just don't want no part of it. And then what happens is you get frustrated. And then you just don't like that person anymore. And you're like, well, fooey on you then. And then what happens is division gets sown in your spirit. And then not only are you unable to reconcile, but now you got Satan at work causing division inside of you as divination manifests itself in your mind. I can't stand that person. I got to go to church on Sunday and see them? Seriously. I sit on the left side so I don't have to see them on the right side. Oh, wait, they're up there worshiping, not me. I'm going to the back, right? Because it's just a place of frustration and anger. And if we're not careful, the unforgiveness, it can cause division to sow in the body of Christ. And Satan operates in division. He can't operate in unity. Satan can't get victory in unity, but he gets victory in division. Remember, isolation, he gets victory. So how can I differentiate when reconciliation happens versus when forgiveness happens? Because when you're trying to reconcile with somebody and they don't want to reconcile with you, you need to go to the next step, which is forgiveness. Reconciliation requires two people, one and two, the one who's been offended and the one who offended. And you have to reconcile together. But if they don't want to reconcile, then forgiveness happens with one person. And sometimes you have to be the person that says, I am just going to forgive no matter what. Forgiveness only takes one. <laughs> forgiveness sometimes has to be our choice and should be our choice. We should be the ones to offer forgiveness first. IPC should be known as the church, the family that forgives. That forgives. Forgives the debts. And so in forgiveness, when I exercise forgiveness, it is a part of my existence in my relationship with Christ. Forgiveness is a part of me walking with Jesus. It's a part of me journeying with Him. And so I'm going to give us a biblical example of forgiveness and reconciliation at work. And so it's found in Genesis chapter 50, verses 17 to 20. And it says this. Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they, saw, when they spoke to him. So in their moment of beseeching for forgiveness... Joseph responds by crying. And then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place, am I not in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, 
but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. You see, sometimes the journey that God has you on will lead you to forgiveness. The path that God puts you on has forgiveness in your future. Sometimes it's unavoidable because God wants us to learn how to forgive. And forgiveness, even though in this particular instance, it's both parties. It's the brothers of Joseph and it's Joseph, both wanting to come together in reconciliation. But for Joseph, he weeps because he's looking at the brothers who years before, 30 years before, were throwing him in a pit and conspiring to kill him. They were the ones that sent him into slavery to Egypt that would change his life forever. He would end up in prison. He would be alone, away from his family, an outcast, a foreigner in a foreign land. And he's looking at his brothers and he's got a choice. Do I forgive these men that changed my whole life or do I withhold forgiveness? You see, forgiveness is not always easy. Forgiveness can be painful. Forgiveness can hurt. When we are in the process of forgiving, it can be painful to us. It can be painful to us to let go of the offense that's been done to me. It can be painful to look at the one in the eye who caused me so much pain and so much grief and say, I forgive you. The trauma caused by you in childhood and looking back and forgiving that person at that point of trauma. It's painful. It's painful, but God's path has you on a path toward forgiveness. Because God knows that if there's unforgiveness in us, He can't use us to our full potential. He can't pull us into the place of victory that He wants us. Unforgiveness and unforgive. An unforgiven mindset can keep us from walking on the path that God has for us. Unforgiveness can literally keep us out of the will of God. Can literally keep us out of the favor of God, the blessings of God. So, forgiveness is not a choice. Forgiveness is not a choice. It is a biblical principle. That if I desire forgiveness, I must also forgive. It's a biblical principle. You mentioned about Joseph, because whenever he, um, when he said that they meant evil, but God worked it for good, he had an understanding that whatever happened to him, it was God allowing it. It wasn't the person, it wasn't trying to blame people for what happened to him. It was just having that understanding, that mindset that he allowed it for a reason because he is purging things out of my heart because he's working in my character. Amen. And so when we're talking about Joseph, I can't help but think about his brothers too because we always paint them as the bad guys, like they're the villain. But I, I always think about the villains of the Bible because <laughs> I'm like, what happened? What, what happened to them? So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Joseph's brothers. So in Genesis 37, verses 3 to 4, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more, Then all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Can you imagine that you are not the favorite one (laughs) and you're just not wanted and there goes the brother that always shows shows off? I'm an only child, so... (laughs) I can, I feel like Joseph is not all the, the angel. I don't think he's working in the field like his brothers, okay? But the root cause of Joseph's brother's um, envy was really their frustration towards their dad. It's not so much that they're angry 
towards uh, Joseph, but they were really angry with their dad. They had daddy issues. <laughs> they do. They really do because, look, you got to go way back. So we got Leah and Rachel, right, that constantly competes with one another. Who got more babies? <laughs> Who can have more children? Constantly comparing themselves with one another. But we all know Jacob loved Rachel more. And so he brought that dysfunction into the brothers. And so that wasn't just something that had happened. It was put in them. The spirit of competition was already there. The dysfunction was already there. So it's not so much that they were so angry at Joseph just because he's got the cool outfit, all the many colors, you know. It's not so much that's the reason why, but because they were just looking for acceptance from their dad. And um, the dysfunction was there, and Joseph's brother's frustration led them to feel unwanted, rejected, and not loved. So that is the root cause of why they did what they did. And sometimes people do things to us, or they say things to us, not because it's, they're against us, but there's a deeper issue, okay? Because sometimes we get offended, we get hurt so much, but we don't realize that there is much, there's a deeper cause that we have no idea about, that they're just not able to express, just like Joseph's brothers. It's so easy for us to judge it. The, the brothers are kind of, how crazy, how can they do that? I can't believe, but really, the Bible doesn't explain their mental health, right? Or like what goes on in their minds while they're so annoyed with their brother. And we don't know what Jacob tells them. And we don't know how they're being treated. But they must have felt unwanted that they, they, they ended up feeling bitter towards their father, and through that, that, that's why they did what they did. Now, I'm not making excuse <laughs> for the brothers. I'm not trying to be their lawyer, okay? <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? It's like there is a root cause of that issue. And so we need to determine what part in our, in our lives that needs healing. Because before we can ever forgive, we have to really know which part in my, my life that needs work, that needs healing, okay? Envy and bitterness took a hold of their hearts. That's not overnight. That's something that was put onto them since Leah, <laughs> since their mom, you know, and Rachel. So they had unresolved issues with their father. They did. They did. They had unresolved issues with their father. So I'm just going to talk quickly about this because um, I'm very interested about unresolved issues. But it can affect your physical health. Did you know that? Did you know that bitterness can actually affect you? It Not only can it give you wrinkles, okay, because there's a lot more to, or gain weight because you'll eat and eat and, like me, you know. <laughs> when I'm upset, I just, I eat when I'm upset and ha happy. It doesn't matter. But anyway, unresolved conflict can affect your physical health. So according to HopkinsMedicine.com, people who hang on to grudges, experience severe depression and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So here's the thing about forgiveness. If you forgive, forgiveness lowers the risk of heart attack, improved cholesterol levels, reduced pain, uh, reduced high blood pressure, uh, reduced levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. There is health benefits to forgiveness, amen? If you don't want to be sick, you better forgive tonight, right now, <laughs> okay? Forgiveness is our ticket to freedom. If you want to be free, we got to forgive. Because you're no longer a slave to your own emotions. Forgiveness is a decision to let go of negative feelings, whether the person deserves it or not. It's just so good. I'm just like, man. You keep going. Whew. When, when, I, when I'm thinking about the healing and the trauma and the pain 
and forgiving in the midst of those actively causing you pain. Because that's the thing. You, you can forgive past pains, but what about forgiving when you are in the midst of a situation that is actively causing you pain? Can I do that? And I, I wonder because, I mean, of course, we're, we're Christians, so what, what does Christian mean? It means to be Christ-like. So we're supposed to be like Jesus. So how did Jesus forgive? I'm, I'm just curious, and in my curiosity, it led me to the biblical narrative of Luke chapter 23, verses 32 to 34, shows us the depths of God's forgiveness. There were two other criminals led with him to be put to death, and when they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. You see, Jesus was in the middle of his death, and he offered forgiveness. He gave forgiveness to those who were killing him. With the nail driven into his hands and the nail driven into his ankles, he was offering forgiveness. When they spat upon him, they offered, he offered them forgiveness. When they, when they would unjustly use him and beat him, he would offer forgiveness. How can I get to that place where I can look at the one who's causing me so much pain and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. How can I do that? Paul reminds us that it's a daily choice that I die daily. Why do I die daily? So I can forgive daily. Because I can't forgive as long as there's pride in me. Pride will keep me from for offering forgiveness. Pride will lift me up and say, oh, they're unworthy of my forgiveness. I have a right to withhold forgiveness. I have a right to be angry. I have a right to be upset. I have a right to not love them because of what they've done to me. It's my right. That's what pride will tell us. But I got to get to this place to where, God, I die daily so that way I can forgive daily. So how did Jesus forgive? Over and over and over and over again. That's how Jesus forgives. I was going to say that um, unforgiveness is, uh, or bitterness is really having sometimes victim mentality. Having victim mentality is entitlement because it's like, you know, well, they did this. I'm hurt. Therefore, I can react like this. I can be this way because I deserve it because I'm hurt. And sometimes we get entitled because of that victim mentality. When you were saying about over and over and over again, I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Matthew 18, verses 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often Shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. What's 70 times seven? Well, what? I'm not good at math. 490? That's like a lot of times, right? <laughs> I don't even know if I can keep track. But we need, basically it's just saying we need to forgive consistently without conditions. Without conditions, it don't matter. Consistent forgiveness. Oh, I don't know if we could do that. It's hard. But forgiveness is commitment. It takes practice. When we are babies, we learned how to speak, to walk, right? It took time for us to develop all the things that we, we know now. And, you know, do you guys remember when your parent would ask, say thank you, say excuse me, right? Say sorry, it's something that we have to learn. It's not, it's not something that it comes natural for us to forgive. Or sometimes it doesn't come natural for us to even say thank you or be thankful. It takes practice. We have to practice forgiveness. So here, I'm going to give you tools because we, we want to leave here um, change and we're going to practice forgiveness starting tonight. <laughs> okay, how to practice forgiveness. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how to just practical tools so that we can all be healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> okay, how to practice forgiveness. Number one, exercise empathy. 
Empathy is having the ability to understand people's emotions. Sometimes we get so caught up with our own emotions only. This is just how I feel, but other people have emotions too, right? Jesus has empathy, so exercise empathy. The next one is acceptance. Accept what already happened. You can't rewind it. I hope we could rewind things, but we can't. (laughs) What happened already happened, and so we just need to accept what happened. And it's up to you if you just want to stay lingering or thinking about that situation over and over again, or you're going to move forward. So acceptance. Next is be accountable. Be responsible to your emotions. No one else is responsible for your emotions but yourself. Your emotions are yours. It's not God's. It's not someone else. It's your responsibility to get it together. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, be responsible She's for your emotions. She's acting like mommy right now. I said you're acting like mommy right yeah, now. Yeah, mom. Okay, so you have control over your emotions. And then the next one is, this is something that we actually already practice, is accountability partner. And um, I encourage you, if you don't have an accountability partner, you need one. And Wait, 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 say that again. If you don't have an accountability partner, you need one. <laughs> James 5.16 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. So we need to choose an accountability partner that will pray for us, that will uplift us. We don't, we don't want to be having an accountability partner that's bitter and negative and you know, I'm grateful for elders in, in our church because I know that they're praying for me. They love me. They're, they're encouraging. There's so many people here in this church that you know you're going to be safe. But I suggest that you pray about an accountability partner that will help you and you'll help them. You're going to build each other up and strengthen one another. And then the last one, so we have exercise empathy. We have acceptance be accountable. We need an accountability partner. The next one is practice gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 to 18 says, see the devil's a liar. He's trying to mix up my notes. See? Can't see. Okay. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There's always something to be thankful for. Always, always be grateful because if you're focused on your gratitude for for God, you'll forget about the other stuff, all the the other things that you don't want to focus on, all the bitterness and the anger. Because if you're thankful, then it's not, you're not going to be too focused on that. Exactly. When we are practicing forgiveness, okay, and that's the thing Sister May is talking about, we are going to practice forgiveness. And you need to practice forgiveness. And maybe the person that you need to forgive is not here tonight. Okay, maybe it's not even a forgiveness that you tell them, I forgive you. It's more of a forgiveness of God, I forgive them. Giving it to Jesus and explaining, letting that go, saying, God, I forgive for what has been done to me. You know, what? how Jesus forgives us, Micah 7, 19 tells us, he will again have compassion on us. And will subdue our iniquities. He will cast out all of our sins into the depths of the sea. He takes our sins and throws them into a sea. Never to be remembered again. Never to be found again. Jesus forgives and forgets. Sister May, can we forgive and forget? We can forgive but not forget. I mean, I I feel like because we're humans and I remember every detail. <laughs> every we were just wired that way. We remember things. But here's the thing about um, forgiveness: is no longer true forgiveness is you're no longer going to be emotionally connected to the situation. You can still remember, but you're no longer connected to that situation where you're getting triggered over and over again. Because we have our brains wired to have the good and the bad memories. I'm going to sound like Bishop Hippocampus. (laughs) 
Is that uh, hippocampus is the thing that is responsible for all the memories. I feel, I feel so smart. <laughs> Hopefully, Brit Bishop, praise the Lord, Bishop. <laughs> but I learned from Bishop that hippocampus is homogenized. <laughs> no, I'm, <joking. laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna start saying all these smart words. <laughs> But um, what, where am I? Hippocampus, okay. Is that <laughs> hippocampus? I love saying that. <laughs> it's that thing, okay? It's that thing that's responsible for the good and the bad memories. We can't help it but remember. But, you know, with, with God, with more of Jesus in our hearts and our spirits, then we're able to forgive. But we're still going to remember but then we're able to, we're not able, uh, see, you can't talk no more after the hippocampus. <laughs> but we're not associating our emotions to that situation anymore because we've already been healed from that. Actually, that's one of the questions, um, right, yesterday was, how do you know when you've already forgiven the person that already, that offended you? It's when you are no longer at, um, attached to that emotions from that, situation yeah Amen. hippocampus <laughs> <laughs> that's really good i hope i'm right yeah don't google it right now <laughs> <laughs> it's okay you sound smart okay, so it's yeah, okay. Yeah. we're homogenized <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> homogenized but i do want to read first corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7 love suffers long and is kind love does not envy love does not parade itself, it's not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In NIV version, verse 5, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. We need to stop keeping record of what others have done. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps no record of wrong because God is love. Yeah. God is love. The more God's spirit we have, the more we're able to access love, yeah. patience, kindness, the fruit of the spirit. The more Jesus we have in us, then we're able to do all of these things with the help of God. We can't do it by ourselves, but with the Holy Ghost, with prayer, with Jesus on our side, then we're able to access all of that. Amen. Some of us need to go home and throw away our record books. We've been keeping all those record of wrongs, and we just need to be done with it. Let it go. Let go of that record book. You see, when Jesus let things go. Hebrews 8, 12, 13 tells us, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. He will remember no more. Why? Because in that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. That new covenant, the old covenant was without mercy. He dealt harshly with his people, but new covenant is rooted in mercy and love. How can you get rid of the record? Through love. Let love reign rather than that record book. Let love be demonstrated in your willingness to forgive. To love is to forgive. To extend mercy is to forgive. Jesus extends mercy through the action of forgiveness. Luke 6.36 tells us, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So in love, I extend forgiveness through that mercy that I'm giving people. People that have wronged me, people who have done injustices towards me. I'm going to extend the hand of mercy and love. I'm going to do away with the record book and I'm going to forgive daily. I may not be able to forget but forgiveness has to happen within me daily. I have to forgive daily. If you are hurting or if you're wounded tonight because 
you're offended or somebody has done something that is wrong, if you're wronged, I want to encourage you tonight. I wrote this little thing in my, uh, my journal when I was going through a season and bitterness in my heart years ago. I put, our hurts, our injuries is the very thing that God uses to fulfill his purpose for our lives. So whatever it is that you're hurting, if you're hurting right now, that's the very thing that's God going, that's God going to use to fulfill his purpose. He's going to use it for his glory. Amen. Amen. We can forgive like Jesus, and when we do, we will enter his culture. We will enter into kingdom culture when we can truly forgive. Forgive as he forgives. And so tonight, our prayer for this family, our prayer for you, is that God gives us all strength to forgive. God gives us all the strength to do away with the record book and let love reign in the place of pride. Let love reign and offer forgiveness where our human self does not want to forgive. Our prayer is God strengthen us to forgive tonight. Amen. Let's all stand together in this room. So, I know tonight was a little different than what we normally do, but it is our prayer, it's our prayer that every single one of us grows and matures into who God has called us to be and what He wants us to be. And He wants us to be a family that forgives. And so if you have unforgiveness in your heart tonight, especially towards a brother or a sister, find that person tonight that's offended you, that you've been hanging on to. Find them and say, I, I want to make this right. You may not even know this, but I want to make it right. Okay? Or maybe they're not here tonight when oh, everybody's going around. Maybe they're not here tonight. Maybe they don't go to this church, and that's fine. But find it in yourself to forgive and offer forgiveness. Amen? Let's pray right now in Jesus' name. God, right now in this room, Jesus, I just pray that your holy conviction settle upon us. And God, help us forgive, Jesus. Give us the strength to forgive, God. Even those that have hurt us so deeply and wronged us so badly, Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that your spirit work in us. God, even when we don't want to, Jesus, help us to extend forgiveness, Jesus. Help us, mighty God, to reach out, Lord, and let love reign in us. Let love bring us together. God, let your mercy be manifest in us as we are merciful. And God, as we forgive our debtors, Jesus, Lord, please forgive us. Lord God, as we forgive those, Jesus, who have wronged us, Lord, please forgive us, Jesus. Lord, as we exercise forgiveness, Lord, please extend forgiveness to us. Thank you, Lord, for helping us. Thank you, Lord, for equipping this family. Lord God, in your kingdom, in your culture, Lord, in your practice, Jesus, of forgiveness, thank you for helping us tonight, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus, and thank you for being with us. We magnify your holy name in Jesus' name. And everyone says amen. Amen, 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 amen. Our elder wants to uh, say something really quickly. Let's give uh, a moment to Brother Raul. We love our elder so much. Appreciate him so much. Well, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that very much. And I am going to learn to forgive better. Um, I had a situation one time when I, you know how honoring I am. And uh, I scared somebody one time. It was so bad. And I almost had to repent. But, but uh, I did. I asked them. I said, listen, I'm, I'm so sorry. I said, would you forgive me? And I'll never forget. They said, only if Jesus will forgive you. And I said, yep, I got it made. So that's not how it works. Thank you so much. That helped us. That helped your people. Amen. The company that leases from us, uh, Cinexcel, or what we call C-Trials, um, will donate 
a few hundred dollars to Bohol, to the children of Bohol. But I need at least six good men that you're as uh, tough as I am to help me lift something that's very heavy. I'd say it's probably around 800 pounds. And um, we need to lift it and move it 40 feet and set it upon a, uh, a stand. But uh, I need someone as strong as uh, uh, Jacob, you know, or uh, Max. Uh, No, <laughs> but I I do I need can but I need to know that you're going to be there. So please help me. Raise your hand if you can help me. Um, okay, I got one. Thank you. Not nine thirty this Saturday. Nine thirty this Saturday, and it 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 won't it won't take that long long at all, brother Lewis. Um, oh, okay. Can you be there at 9.30? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Uh, pardon me? No, it's not my Jeep. Um, Brother Jesse, are you going to be? Uh, you're almost as tough as I am. Almost. 9.30. Can, I, need, I need some strong men. I really do. All right. So raise your hand if you can be there. Oh, get your hand down. Are you volunteering your all right, Brother David, thank you so much. That's one, two, three, four, five. Where you at? Where you at? Where you at? Whoa, there you are. All right, six. Can we have a backup in case one of you sleep in? Who is that? All right. All right. All right, all right. Do, do you know where the property's at down there? 17800 Woodruff? Okay, all right, we'll be there. All right. All right, yes, where Brother Nello lives. And I live. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Meet me by my Jeep. There'll be a red Jeep sitting out there. And, uh, and that way we, I know that you're going to be there. All right, God bless you. Pastor, I love you so much. Amen, family. We love you. Let's practice forgiveness together and let God heal us. Amen? We'll see you Sunday in Jesus' name. Come expecting God to do something great for Friend Day and Heroes Day. Amen? We love you. We're always here for you. Let's do something great for Jesus together. Amen.